Jirai once wanted to be a hero. He wanted to be that knight in shining armor, with a holy sword in hand, slaughtering demons, defeating the demon lord, and marrying some nation's princess. It was an honest life and an honest dream. But now that dream is a thing of the past. A young, peppy girl suddenly comes up to Jirai's door and asks him to become a member of her party. Not wanting to get scammed or listen to whatever gospel she's trying to preach, Jirai shuts the door behind him. The girl relentlessly slams on his door anyway. He opens the door just enough to poke his head through and threatens to call the knights on her. But this does not deter her one bit. She forces her way inside and introduces herself as ready. Jirai stares at his now unhinged door and asks her if she's going to reimburse him for it. She has an even better idea. He should join her attack party. She entices him with more benefits, such as a place to live, a guaranteed harem, and flexible medical dental plans. Jirai is surprised to learn that she's the attack hero, which means she isn't a hero from this generation. When a holy sword chooses a user, a mark will appear somewhere on their body, which signifies their status as a hero. Reedy was chosen by the Holy Sword Grand Virgu, which grants her the title of the attack hero. There has recently been an explosion of hero candidates, including a certain black-haired one. All of this is just a pain in the neck for Jirai though. He sighs and tells Reti that she has the wrong person. He digs into his jacket and brings out a small tag, which shows that he's nothing but an unexceptional D-rank adventurer. However, Reedy insists that she has the right person. She is a bit displeased that Jirai doesn't remember her, so she tries to jog his memory by holding up her hair in a specific hairstyle. The pieces all fall into place for Jirai. He recalls her from an incident where he saved her from being eaten by a great bear, but this only troubles him even more. Reedy explains that she's admired him ever since that incident, and she always wanted to become a hero. She even remembers his parting words, an extremely embarrassing monologue that even I'm too embarrassed to say out loud. Jirai's horrific past as a cringe Chunidu hero has come back to haunt him, and he begs Reddy to forget all about his less than eloquent speech. Despite this, Reedy is still insistent on having him join her party. Ever since she saw him in the nearby town, she felt that fate had brought them back together. Reedy asks her why it has to be him, since she clearly doesn't need his help to fight any monsters. Reedy simply smiles. Being in a party with him was also one of her dreams. She presses him for an answer, and he bluntly says that he won't join. Reedy closes her eyes, exhales, and pretends not to hear him. Jirai awkwardly repeats that he won't join, and again, Reedy pretends not to hear him. What follows is an hours-long endurance contest that Reedy ultimately emerges victorious from. Jirai relents and agrees to join, but only for a short while. She tries to set the duration to 50 years, but that isn't what Jirai had in mind when he said short. He offers to accompany her only until she makes her first great achievement, and she agrees. From now on, they're together until she defeats the Demon Lord. This is turning out to be more trouble than Jirai first expected. He asks what the party name is now that he's joined, and she excitedly dubs it the Black-Haired Heroes because she has terrible naming conventions. Jirai tells her that he'll submit their party application at the local guild, and he asks her to come by another day when all the paperwork is in order. Reedy enthusiastically salutes him. After she leaves, Jirai quickly makes plans to dip. Ain't no way he's joining some rando's party and there's definitely no chance in hell that he's going to fight the Demon Lord. But it wasn't always this way. Jirai wanted to be a hero. In his fervor, he drank a lot of horrible-tasting potions to increase his magic power, polished his magic and sword skills, and embarked on many adventures that brought him into conflict with demons. He eagerly waited for the moment that the Holy Mark would appear, which would then fulfill his dream. However, being a hero was simply a means to an end. He didn't respect heroes per se, but he wanted what came after being a hero an easy life of kingship. One day, while eating lunch at an inn, he overhears a few adventurers talking about how hard the heroes have it. It's killing demons, day in, day out, with little time to rest. However, one of them remarks that it doesn't get any easier even after becoming king. You'd be just as busy as though you were still a hero. Hearing this, Jiri ran out. He evidently didn't do enough research about what it means to become a hero, and upon learning that it's actually more of a job than a great adventure, he felt cheated. He saw no point in all the struggles and trials he went through. On that day, he made a decision. He'd only earn enough money to live and spend his time leisurely. No heroic ventures for him. Jure escapes to the central town of Heroisville, where he hopes to slip away in the ocean of people. However, he notices that there seem to be even more people than usual. A hooded stranger bumps into Jure, and they awkwardly apologize to each other. He notices the girl has white hair, which is just as unusual as his black hair. They go their separate ways, but Jure spots a pendant that the girl appears to have dropped. 
He picks it up and decides to drop it off at the night's office after he finishes shopping. After doing his groceries, Jure walks outside and learns why the whole town is in an uproar. The princess, Refine, is nearby. Once a month, Refine, the fourth princess, is allowed to walk outside. The princess doesn't concern him, and he hops into bed. A month later, Jure is flat out broke. With only 500 gold left in his pouch, he has no choice but to accept a guild request. He finds a job posting for an escort mission, which seems to pay well. The unnamed client is requesting up to 15 people to accompany them while they travel to the kingdom of Atoll, which by carriage is just five days away, though Jure finds it strange that the client isn't named and that there is no required rank, the upside is so good that he's willing to ignore this obvious red flag. However, once he arrives at the meeting point, he has the misfortune of running into Reddy. She holds up a guild application that she thinks he forgot to hand in, and all it needs now is his signature. It appears that Jure's dream of living a leisurely life may not be so easily achieved. Reedy weighs a guild member application form in Jure's face, and she repeatedly invites him onto her party. However, Reedy doesn't seem to be alone anymore. Two girls appear to have been adventuring with Reedy ever since Jure left, like his father did. Reedy boasts that Jure is super strong, but one of the girls is unimpressed. Reedy says that Jure is actually secretly powerful, and she quickly realizes that she doesn't even know his name. How does she, out of all people, not know his name? Jure introduces himself to Reddy's party members and says that his special hobby is sleeping. Reedy introduces herself and tells them that she hates all vegetables. The hooded, quiet girl is Eve, while the twin tails wearing girl is Lena, a ranking mage. Jure recognizes Lena's last name, Antetman. He once clashed with another girl from her family bearing the same name and almost the same appearance, but he keeps that information to himself. It'll be a huge pain in the neck if she turns out to be just as annoying to deal with, so Jirai decides to limit interacting with her as much as possible. Reedy holds a vote to see if they should let Jirai into their party, and neither Eve nor Lena have any objections. Eve, however, seems rather indifferent. Since it's three against one, Jirai has to join her party. God, I love democracy. Jirai points out that Eve saying she doesn't mind is basically the same as saying she doesn't want him here. Reedy removes Eve's hood to show that she has a join us face, but her face is plain expressionless. Reedy hounds Eve for an affirmative answer, while Jure reasons that she wouldn't want some weirdo joining their all-girl group. Bothered by their persistence, Eve repeats that she doesn't care whether Jure joins or not, and she storms off. Lena tells them not to pay her any mind. Jure mm. notices that the client doesn't seem to be here yet, but another troubling existence enters the fray. Kane, a B-rank adventurer, pushes Jure out of the way so he can speak to Reedy the hero. A noble through and through, Kane showers Reedy with high praise and accolades, but Jure observes that Reedy has no idea who this person is. Kane's mood quickly soars when he notices that a disgusting D rank adventurer is among them. He makes no effort to hide his disdain for Jure. Jure says that he's just here for the request, and Kane takes this opportunity to properly educate him, as is the duty of all noble families. He arrogantly tells Jure that while this quest was open to all ranks, only those of rank C and above should have had the right to join it. Though Jirai acknowledges his point, the fact remains that there was no rank requirement, so Jirai has every right to be there. Kane accuses him of being here just so he can suck up to some nobles or scrape up some leftovers, and it is precisely this rodent-like behavior that Kane hates low-rank adventurers like him. Kane grabs a pouch of gold from his coat and scatters it across the floor. He knows that Jirai wants money, so he tells him to pick it up from the ground. Reedy can't believe what's happening. Kane tells Jirai that the moment he picks up the gold, he is to leave this quest immediately. A D-rank adventurer like him would just be dead weight. Jure squeezes his hand. Sure, he's desperate for money, and sure, he's a deplorable human being, but he won't accept Kane badmouthing his D-rank peers. He exclaims that many D-rank adventurers are stellar experts in their fields, and many bring their talents to the homeless and orphanages. He knows more than anyone that D-rank adventurers aren't trash. Except for him, maybe. Kane pays his ramblings no mind, and he tells him again to just pick up the gold and leave. Jure begins picking up the pieces, but he suddenly changes his mind. As a matter of fact, Kane might need this gold more than he does. Kane scoffs. He's the third son of the esteemed Stoll's family. He has money in spades, and the gold on the ground is nothing more than loose change. Jure insists that Kane needs it more than him. He is, after all, just the third son. He has no right to inherit the head position of his family so he'll need all the gold he can get to butter up some richer noble. Jirai publicly exposes Kane. 
He only got to B rank because of his family's connections, not by his merit alone. Kane draws his sword and attacks Jiray, and Jiray prepares to defend himself. However, a soothing voice calms them both and instructs them to lower their weapons. Kane's body moves on its own, and he drops his sword to the ground. Jiray recognizes the technique the girl used, word magic. To be able to compel someone with their voice alone takes considerable natural talent and skill. He notices that the girl has black hair, the same as him, but she seems to be masking her true appearance using a ring of transformation. The Scooby-Doo mystery keeps getting deeper. The girl permits Kane to speak, and he demands to be freed at once. He snarls that he is the third son of the Stolz family, and the girl says that she was the one who put up the escort mission to Ital. She is the client, Fena. She had high hopes when she learned that the Stolz family was sending a capable adventurer, but after seeing how Kane conducted himself, she has changed her mind. He probably killed his brother too. Though she would love nothing more than to cancel his contract now, she keeps the reputation of the Stolz family in mind. She allows him to stay, but threatens to report him the next time he acts out of line. Next, she turns to Jiray. Though Kane was undeniably the aggressor in all this, Jiray needlessly fanned the flames that caused this go way out of hand. She has a lot more to say to him, so she orders Jiray to ride in the same carriage as her. Reedy is pumped that Jiray gets to ride with the client, but since this seems nothing more than another lecture, Jiray doesn't share her excitement. A few minutes later, they depart for the kingdom of Ethel. Jiray sits alone with Finna in her carriage. After some self-introductions, Fena admits that she isn't here to lecture him. In fact, she has some questions to ask him instead. She asks him if he knows anyone from his hometown who has black hair and wears a mask, but he replies that he doesn't. As far as he knows, only he had black hair in his hometown. However, he does remember that a black-haired hero was recently chosen in Etal, and Fena jumps to her feet. This person is the person that she has been longing to meet. Finally, she'll be able to meet this fated person of hers. Fina snaps out of her trance and apologizes for acting strangely. Now that Jiray can think more calmly about it, this request to Etal means that Fina is traveling there just to meet him. The reason why Fina hid her name was also to hide her noble social standing. Even the name Fina is nothing more than a pseudonym. She apologizes for the deception, but Jiray doesn't mind. He pulls back the blinds and gestures to the carriage rider in front. As long as she is here, they'll be safe. Fina is surprised that Jiray noticed. Jiray can tell that the woman in front is quite skilled. It was needless of Fena to hire adventurers for this mission, but he can tell that she doesn't intend to let this masked woman fight at all costs, lest it reveal who she is. Fena confirms his suspicions, and she is impressed. She had heard that he was a D-rank adventurer, but now that she knows how he thinks and acts, he doesn't seem to match that description at all. Jiray changes the subject and asks her what kind of person the person she's looking for. Fena's eyes gleam, and she leaps out of her seat. She relishes any opportunity to gush about this person. It's a precious memory of hers, and out of respect for his black hair, she'd be happy to tell him. She starts from the beginning, when she was six years old. Three hours later, after a riveting tale involving Optimus Prime, the Queen, and Peter Griffin, the mysterious person of hers saved her like a prince on a white horse. She flashes a ring on her finger, which she says was also given to her by this person. He had even promised to marry her in the future. Jiri, visibly drained, can do nothing but nod his head. Fena asks if he's really listening, and he simply nods along. Jiray smiles. She has high expectations for this black-haired hero because she remembers that it was their dream to become a hero. Fena's stomach suddenly growls, which embarrasses her. Jiray summons his item box, because of course he has an item box. This wouldn't be a fantasy series without one. He digs up a bag of treats for her to eat. However, she's more preoccupied with the fact that Jiri nonchalantly used spatial magic. Though it is relatively easy to learn, actually using it requires massive amounts of mana, so only specialized porters or high-class mages can use it without draining themselves. Jiray doesn't know what she's talking about. He just read about it in a book. She moves on to what Jiray pulled out, a pouch of the famous and incredibly cute Chartet snacks. They usually sell out almost immediately, but Jiray has an acquaintance who regularly sends him a pack as a favor. He doesn't have a sweet tooth, so he doesn't mind giving it to Fina instead. Fena graciously accepts it, but isn't there somebody they forgot to ask? Reedy, clinging onto the side of the carriage, presses her face against the window and stares at the Chartet snack. Jiri reluctantly offers her some too, and she climbs inside. Fena suggests that they all take a short break. Reedy indulges herself in the sweet snack, and Jiri hands some extra pouches to Eve and Lena as well. He tries offering some to Kane, but he sulks and tells him to buzz off. Jiray leaves the pouch next to Kane to let him know what he thinks of it if he decides to try it. Kane wonders why Jiray is being so nice to him, 
even though he had tried so hard to belittle him. Jirai wakes up in the middle of the night. Wed, another adventurer who accepted the escort quest, tells him that it's time to change shifts. Jirai had forgotten he had the graveyard shift for the night watch. He was sleeping so soundly thanks to all the high-class food that Finna gave him as thanks for listening to her story. Wed tells Jirai not to let his guard down during the night watch. If he hadn't been a married man, he might have succumbed to the angel. Jirai doesn't understand what that was all about, but the reason becomes apparent when he sees his night watch partner, Fena. Jirai is confused about why the client herself is keeping watch, but she figured that she might as well try keeping watch. She rarely has the opportunity to go on adventures like this, so it'll be a valuable experience. Jirai is worried that monsters might appear in the middle of the night, but Fena is confident in her own battle skills. Even though her head looks empty 90% of the time, she's quite proud of her strength. Jirai decides to go along with her whims, but he asks her if her guard actually approved of her sitting out here. Fena hadn't considered that. She just snuck away while she wasn't looking. Fen is going to be in big trouble later. Regardless, Fena is confident in standing watch. There aren't any overly powerful monsters tonight either, so she urges Jirai to go back to his tent to sleep. Be that as it may, Jirai would be too worried to leave her alone outside. He decides to stay. Jirai is surprised that Fena was able to tell that there aren't any strong monsters around, and he deduces that she must also have some measure of detection magic in her repertoire. He performs a second check, just in case, and he sees a glimmer of light in a nearby bush. He sharply tosses a stone in the direction of the light, and he ends up frightening a small drooping rabbit. The dropping rabbit hops out of the bushes, and Jirai picks it up. They are relatively harmless d rank monsters, but they are quite rare. Fena is instantly enamored by this small, fluffy creature, and Jirai learns that this is her first time laying eyes on one. He explains that the meat and other parts of the drooping rabbit sell for a high price, so he asks her to turn around while he deals with it. Fena looks at him with a deadly stare, and he lowers his knife. He asks her if she'd like to touch it, and only someone insane would turn that down. While Fena pets the rabbit, Jirai spies a familiar-looking pendant around her neck. Fena raises it up for him to look at and explains that it is her treasure. She had lost it a while back, but a kind person brought it back to her. Jirai thinks he was mistaken in believing it belonged to that white-haired girl. Fena says that inside the pendant is a photo of the person she is looking for, so every time she looks at her pendant, all she can think of is him. Jure starts sweating bullets. He doesn't think he can survive another painfully long monologue about him. Suddenly, the mood turns somber. Fena confides that she has doubts about embarking on this journey to find this person. There is a distinct possibility that this person might be dead. She did, after all, wait nine whole years for him. Jure reassures her that this person is still alive. His source? Trust me, it was revealed to me in a dream. Fena is happy that Jure comforted her like that. Despite his appearance, he's actually surprisingly kind. Jure isn't used to being complimented, though it's obviously natural that he's handsome. He just lacks the motivation and drive to really apply himself. He tells her all about his outlook and motto for doing just the right amount of work. He's free to do whatever, wherever, and whenever he wants. It's a stress-free life. Fena is encouraged by his words. Jure tells her that as long as it's a decision she made herself, she'll be fine, even if she wants to elope with her special person. Fena smiles. She can somehow feel that it might happen soon, and she might just be reckless enough to make it happen. Jure jokes that she's waited nine years to meet him. She's damn well entitled to do it. Fena is pleasantly surprised to find herself talking about all these things with him, and he offers to hear out any more of her worries. This proves to be a critical mistake, and she jumps at another chance to tell him even more stories about her special person. I am willing to bet money that Jure is actually that special person. A few days have passed since they set out for Ital. They encountered a few monsters along the way, but they were nothing that the highly experienced adventurers couldn't handle. Eventually, they make it out of the perilous forest and discover a village, where they decide to rest for the night. However, upon approaching the village gates, they notice that there aren't any guards posted. Even stranger is that there don't seem to be any people, almost as if it's no SpongeBob day. An old man stumbles out of his house, and he tells them that every single person in the village got kidnapped. The old man, a simple tourist, recounts that a few days ago, monsters and men wearing black masks tore through the city. The whole village was looted for its food, goods, and precious metals. Even worse, practically all the villagers were taken away. These bandits were able to sneak into the city by intimidating a merchant and hiding inside his cargo hold. The village was helpless to fight back. Wed wonders if they're up against bandits that have beast tamers in their ranks, but Eve remarks that they're up against something worse than nappers. Kidnappers. Fena points out that slavery was abolished on the continent a few years ago, but Jirai retorts that the same isn't true for the other continents. 
Slavery is alive and well across their borders, especially in countries mainly occupied or ruled by beast folk. Since beast folk themselves were mercilessly oppressed and colonized by humans in the past, they have little interest in outlawing human slaves. The only reason the old man survived was because he was judged to be unfit for work. Jure asks Fena what her next move is. He and the other adventurers only accepted an escort mission. But what happens in this instance is dependent on her, the client. He tells her that they still have a chance to catch up to the kidnappers, and Fena doesn't hesitate. They'll save the villagers at all costs. Her sense of justice won't allow her to ignore them. Wed asks how they plan to track down these kidnappers, and Fena volunteers to use her clairvoyant spell. However, her guard prevents her from doing anything rash, reasoning that the disguise she painstakingly put up with would no longer have any meaning. Jure sticks his hand into his item box and brings out a pair of magic binoculars. Fena and her guard stare blankly at it. They travel a short distance, and Jurai uses the binoculars to spot the kidnappers herding the villagers into a cave. He hands it to Fena so she can take a look herself, and she is relieved that the villagers are at least unharmed. However, as Wed points out, the kidnappers appear to be controlling Rank B dire wolves, numbering well over 60. They'd be slaughtered if they rushed in with the numbers they have, not to mention that the kidnappers might use the villagers as hostages. Their only chance is to sneak inside and rescue the villagers without alarming the kidnappers. A diversion is necessary while a small group heads inside, but Lena offers an alternative option, to go in, guns blazing, and destroy them all. Jure doesn't understand why they're all agonizing over something that has a simple solution. They'd be just fine attacking from the front, since they do have the attack hero on their side. With her overwhelming might, the kidnappers may as well be a nuisance. Everyone completely forgot that Reedy was the attack hero, even Reedy herself. The adventurers charge in, guns blazing. Lena burns the kidnappers alive with her flames, while Wed makes sparks fly with his thunder magic. A few desperate kidnappers send forth their wolves as a last resort, but Reedy easily cleaves through them like wet paper. Jirai is busy watching the fight unfold from the ceiling. The reason why Jure is just chilling on the ceiling like this is because he was assigned as the house visitor. Despite being a shrewd tactician and observer, he is, at his core, still a D-rank adventurer, and he has nearly no combat prowess to speak of. More accurately, he doesn't really feel like fighting either. However, what bothers him are the skull masks that the kidnappers are wearing. It's not because they ripped them off from Team Skull, it's because they look eerily similar from an incident long ago. Surprised that he was remembering his past, he pushes the thoughts into the back of his head. Just in case, he uses his detection magic to see how the evacuation of the villagers is going. Seeing that it is progressing smoothly, the only thing left is to wrap up the destruction of the kidnappers. He spots Kane fighting off one of the dire wolves, and he notices someone sneaking up on him. The kidnapper lunges at Kane with a knife. Jirai wants to save him, but he has little time to act. Seeing no other alternative, Jirai jumps into action. He uses his ability, Marionette, to eloquently convince the kidnapper to use the knife on himself instead. He can be pretty darn convincing. Kane is surprised to see the body fall unceremoniously behind him, but he quickly has to handle the dire wolf gnashing its teeth at him again. Observing him from afar, Jure remarks that Kane isn't actually that bad of a fighter. Though he definitely isn't B-rank, his movements would at least make him a capable C-rank adventurer. However, he wonders why Kane refuses to use body strengthening, an invaluable skill for any magic swordsman to use. Presence detection doesn't seem to be in his repertoire either. Jure decides not to pry any further. <laughs> Meanwhile, Reddy and the other adventurers finish off the last of the kidnappers, and they prepare to rendezvous back with the rescue group. Jure jumps down to where the kidnappers were hurting the villagers, where he undoes an illusion spell cast on the wall. A way opens through, revealing a large magic circle on the ground. Elsewhere, one of the kidnappers has managed to escape, bringing with him a small artifact. Though he is frustrated that his plans have been messed up by the attack hero, he can always try again at a different location. Suddenly, he feels his body buckle under the effects of a paralysis spell cast by Jure. Jure notices the band of subordination bells that the man possesses, which is quite an unusual magic tool. If you had something like that, it'd let you control a whole lot of monsters. The man is confused as to how Jure discovered and found him so quickly and Jure explains that he simply followed the transfer magic circle that he had left behind. Jure tells him to go back to school and practice magic. The consolement spell the man used was downright pathetic. Jure knew that the kidnappers had an ace up their sleeve, like the transfer circle. It would be near impossible to smuggle that many prospective slaves across the border, so a large-scale transfer circle would be their only course of action. Deducing that the circle leads to the Bestia continent, Jure successfully analyzes and destroys it. 
Jirai pulls out the skull mask and asks the man if he is a remnant of the Skull Brigade, and the stuttering is the only answer he needs. Jirai was sure he had eliminated every single one of them. He was careless. With a sigh, he turns around and leaves. Now that his work here is done, the man prepares to run the moment that the paralysis effects wear off, but what Jiri failed to mention is that his paralysis spell is also laced with a potent poison effect if he tries to forcibly move. Now that he foolishly tried to, the poison will kill him within minutes. The man begs for help and an antidote, so Jirai decides to hear him out. He kneels in front of the dying man and asks if he swears to change his ways and surrender to the knights. He readily swears it, but Jirai suddenly grabs his hair and reveals that he has long learned not to trust the likes of him. Jirai asks him if he knows how slaves are treated on the Bestia continent. They're treated like slaves, but worse. Many regret ever being born, and their cries for help fall on deaf ears. Jirai feels no need to treat a slave trader with any kindness, and he leaves him for dead. The man crawls up and uses the last of his strength to drop a subordination bell he had concealed, spurring the nearby wolves into action. If he's going down, then he's taking Jirai with him. The wolves pounce on Jirai, but he simply tells them to stop and to open a path. The man watches helplessly as Jirai walks away unharmed. His power, his demeanor. It's almost as if this man is the demon lord himself. Jirai agonizes over the incredibly embarrassing thing he just did. Wed asks him if there's something bothering him, but Jerry shakes his head. A few hours ago, Jerry chased a group of human traffickers, followed them through their teleportation circle, and accidentally let his Chonyunubu side see the light of day. It can't be helped. He'll just forget about all of it right now. The village prepared a banquet for them, so it'd be bad if he just spent his time agonizing over his embarrassing and cringy past. While Jerry indulges himself in the prime meat, he notices Kane walking away on his own. He chases after him and invites him to eat, but Kane considers himself unworthy of partaking in the feast. He wasn't able to do a single thing during the battle with the cultists. In fact, he struggled against a single wolf, of all things. All he did was drag everyone else down. Jerry nonchalantly remarks that he didn't do much either, so Kane shouldn't stress out over things he can't control. Kane snaps at Jerry, exclaiming that their worlds are miles apart. He is the third son of the S.H. Dahl's family completely different from some no-name peasant like him. Their situations couldn't be more different. Kane is carrying heavy expectations on his shoulders. However, despite his proud bravado, Kane is, more than anyone else, painfully aware of his lack of talent. Kane was born without any innate magic. Since magic was crucial to his family's brand of swordsmanship, he had no choice but to lean on his physical prowess instead. Unfortunately for him, he isn't Rock Lee, and he was ultimately unable to catch up to his older brothers. His father loved him, but since he wanted to keep up appearances, Kane was given a decorative B rank. However, this served as an opportunity for Kane. He hoped that if he was able to produce results on the battlefield, then even he would have a place where he could belong. One day, Kane stumbled upon a group of low ranking adventurers while he was trying to recruit some members to join his party. He couldn't care less that their ranks were low, he was just happy to finally gain some comrades. To him, going on adventures with them was fun. However, one evening, while walking to his party's lodgings at an inn, he overhears them badmouthing him behind his back. That was when he realized that they were only using him for his deep pockets to finance their adventures, and not once did they consider Kane a comrade or a friend. To them, Kane was just a useful sponsor. This was the final straw for Kane. From that day on, he considered all low-ranking adventurers parasites, clinging to the legs of the affluent upper class. I actually feel sympathy for the guy now. He wasn't a complete tool for no reason. Jure, confused as to why Kane was just kneeling down clutching his head for five minutes, simply shrugs his shoulders and walks away. But before he goes, he tosses a bag of the Chartet snack that he was unable to give him earlier. Kane stares at the bag in his hands, and he wonders why Jure is being so nice to someone like him. Jure returns to the feast, and he wonders what Kane is depressed about. Just don't be depressed like him. It's that easy. With the conclusion of the kidnapping incident, Jure and the other adventurers return to their escort mission. During one lunch break, Jure takes advantage of the easygoing atmosphere by taking a nap underneath a tree. However, when he wakes up, he sees Reddy, Eve, and Lena frolicking in the water in front of him. All he wanted was a nap, not three beauties playing in the water. Why does God punish him so? Reddy, Eve, and Lena are frolicking in the water, and it spells disaster for Jure. He was just taking a nap, and to ensure that he wasn't disturbed, he placed a camouflage spell over himself, meaning he hadn't been discovered. But if he moves a muscle, they'll all find out, and he'll be labeled a peeping top and put on the registry. Lena remarks that she finds Fina a bit of an oddball of a noble, 
since she isn't the stereotypical high and mighty type. She then remembers that Reddy and E are something like nobles themselves, though Reddy isn't 100% sure if his family is one. Lena also distinctly remembers that Eve refused to engage in friendly talks with them, but here she is, holding a conversation. Lena smirks and asks her what's up with that, and Eve tells her to shut up. More importantly, Eve is worried about being seen by anyone else. Jury nearly had a heart attack on the spot. Lena reassures her that they won't be seen. She earlier confirmed that they were alone thanks to a combination of detection magic and a barrier spell to keep people out. The only way someone could peep on them now is if someone had some high-level camouflage spell to keep them hidden. But that's extremely unlikely. Jure, currently using a high-level camouflage spell, starts sweating even harder. Lena asks what Eve is worked up about, and she asks if she has some secret romance brewing. She denies it, but her denial makes Lena even more suspicious. Eve remarks that she is a firm believer in only showing someone you like this much skin, and she was told by someone that they don't like people who don't take care of themselves. Just as Lena suspected, Eve has someone she likes. She's admittedly envious of her. Out of curiosity, Lena asks Eve what she'd do if someone ended up seeing her in a bikini. Without hesitation, Eve says that she'd make sure that they regret living. Jury uncontrollably screeches, which the girls hear. It's only a matter of time before they stumble upon his invisible body based on the sound of his voice. But Jure has one thing left up his sleeve. When Lena and Eve reach the shore, all they find is a small drooping rabbit. Jure tries to use this opportunity to escape, but he picked the wrong form to try and escape the girls. Eve holds Jure's rabbit form hostage while Lena tickles his stomach. Reddy returns with a large fish she caught, and upon seeing a rabbit, she decides that their lunch for today will be meat and fish. Jerry starts panicking even harder. For all his power, he is painfully unskilled at metamorphosis magic. His time limit for maintaining this rabbit form is a paltry three minutes. Eve mistakenly removes one of her hands, giving Jerry the prime opportunity to escape. Eve is sorely disappointed. Jerry escapes into the nearby forest, counting his blessings that he was able to escape alive. He then notices a considerable number of spirits gathering in one spot, and when he moves closer to investigate, he discovers a bare beauty basking in them. It's a sight straight out of a fairy tale. Jure can only describe her beauty as angelic. Pure white hair, scarlet eyes, and smooth, flawless skin. She's the spitting image of everyone's female JRPG character. Realizing that he's being the peeping Tom that E was worried about, Jure gets away before he does anything he might regret. But it dawns on him that he's never seen anyone who looks like that woman before. Jure returns to camp, where Wed invites him to play cards. Jure turns him down, swearing that Wed must be cheating one way or another. Jury enjoys the laid-back atmosphere a little longer, as they are extremely close to their target city, Edel. He expects their scouts to return any moment now, and with it their adventures together will come to an end. A scout returns, but his demeanor is frantic and panicked. He warns them all that Edel has fallen to an invasion of monsters. Jury and the other adventurers sneak into the city, where they spot all sorts of monsters, zombies, skeletons, and wraiths. The racial sensitivity training really paid off. Though their numbers are impressive, Jerry notices that the monsters are unable to actually penetrate the city's defensive barrier. The fact remains that the city is surrounded. However, Eve makes a chilling revelation. It would be impossible to summon such a large number of monsters without recasting the spell over and over again. These monsters were, without a doubt, the city's residents. Fina is still adamant that the person she is looking for is still alive, but Lena tells her to face the facts. It's extremely unlikely that anyone could have possibly survived this apocalyptic hellscape. Kane suggests that they retreat from here as soon as possible, and Wed gives him permission to do so. They won't think badly of him if he wants to run away. Kane tells him to take a good look around. Fighting here is pointless. Wed retorts that once the barrier breaks down, the horde of monsters will simply wander into the neighboring kingdoms, towns, and villages. Their foremost priority now is to buy time. You never see a kingdom where his family is, is close by. Retreat isn't an option for Wed. Wed asks Jure to accompany Kane and Fina to University Kingdom to ask for backup, while the rest of the adventurers stay behind to try and contain the situation. However, Fina insists on staying. There's something she has to check on, no matter what. Kane is flabbergasted by their resolution to stay behind. He asks them why they aren't scared of staying and possibly dying, but Wed replies that losing someone dear to him is even scarier. Kane realizes that this is his last chance to prove himself as something more than his family name. Though terrified, he asks if he could be of help in the upcoming battle. Wed beams. <laughs> it looks like Kane actually has some backbone after all. Jury realizes that if nobody is running, 
then he'll end up being drawn into the fight too. He wanted to run away, damn it. Wood asks him what he plans to do, and since he'll get cancelled if he tries to run, he reluctantly announces his decision to stay and fight. First, they need to formulate a plan. They need to identify whoever transformed the city's residents into hordes of monsters. Unfortunately, Jury's magical tool is no help, and he is unable to find the spellcaster responsible for this dire situation. Seeing no other alternative, Fina removes her ring. Despite her bodyguard's protest, Fina reveals her true identity, Raffine Odium Refinado, the crown princess of the empire. Her appearance changes to that of pure white hair, red eyes, and flawless skin. Raffine didn't want to reveal her identity unless she absolutely had to, but because her high-level clairvoyant spell requires her to reveal her true name she had to, Jury realizes now why the town they left was in such an uproar. It was because Raffine herself was there, but that also means that Jury was peeping on Raffine while she was in that pond, which makes him a criminal. He decides to take that secret with him to his grave. Raffine's guard, Xion, continues to voice her protests, but Raffine simply commands her to be quiet. Making this decision to reveal herself was not an easy one. Raffine steps forward, kneels, and begins casting her clairvoyance magic to seek out the person responsible for turning this place into a resident evil stage. Raffine prays to the great spirits dwelling nearby, and invoking her authority as the fourth princess of Universia, she commands them to aid her in her clairvoyance spell. A pulse of magical energy emanates from her, penetrating deep into the city. Jure is impressed. The clairvoyance spell is hard to pull off, and he pegs Raffine to be at least an S-ranked magician. He had attempted to study the clairvoyance spell once before, but because it required a lot of readings he gave up. But it dawns on him that he could just copy the magic circle that Raffine used. He stares intently at Raffine's magic casting, and he recreates the spell based on nothing more than what he sees. He casts his own version of clairvoyance. He sees a glimmer of light that isn't supposed to be there. He turns around, and he sees a mysterious, cloaked lick standing there menacingly. Fortunately, none of the other adventurers have noticed him so far but that means Raffine's clairvoyance was too weak to pick him up. The Lick smiles, and he muses that it must be time for him to go on the attack. The Death Lick starts laughing maniacally. He introduces himself as Kef's the Death Eater, one of the four heavenly kings serving the Demon Lord, and he invites them all into an eternal sleep provided by yours truly. Raffine and the other adventurers are caught off guard. Raffine's clairvoyance spell hadn't detected him at all. Kavs finds it laughable that they thought their puny spells could detect a presence like his. He only revealed himself because he pitied the fact that they couldn't find him first. One of the adventurers attacks Kavs with a void blade attack, but it fails to penetrate Kavs's barrier. Kavs asks the boy if he's using a toy sword. Kavs detests people like him, weaklings who think they can make an impact on the world. With the flick of a finger, Kavs leaves a gaping hole in the scout's stomach. Raffine immediately calls for mages to heal the boy but they have their work cut out for them to try and restore a missing stomach. Only Jury saw what hit the scout, a magic bullet. He was able to weaken it, but even then, it was enough to nearly kill the scout in a single hit. For the first time, Jury feels like they're in grave danger. Their healing efforts mean that the scout will live, but just barely. He needs a hospital, and fast. Kefs asks if they'd understood the position they're in, but Reddy steps forward to be his opponent. Kefs assumes that she must be this generation's hero. Reddy nods, and she also needlessly introduces Jury as her master, whom she boasts is 10 billion times stronger than Kefs. Kefs finds that amusing. 10 billion times stronger, you say? But he digresses. Kefs has accomplished what he came here to do. He notices that Lena has been preparing a spell for a while now, and he is insulted that she thought he wouldn't notice. It's time for him to wrap this up. Kefs is eager to please the Demon Lord, who should be even more pleased to learn that he has eliminated the black-haired hero. When Raffine hears this, she is in disbelief. There's no way the person she is searching for could be dead, just like that. Kefs has no reason to lie to them. He points at the hero's once gallant figure, now mindlessly sitting on a cafe chair. The hero was so weak that Kefs thought he was a bug at first. Raffine begins suffering a mental breakdown, and Xion struggles to get her master to pull herself together. Kefs floats into the air, and he subjects the entire group to a powerful gravity spell. Their bodies suddenly feel tens of times heavier than before, and they are unable to do more than lift up their heads. With this, they won't be able to escape, even if they tried. Jury certainly didn't expect Reddy and the other A-rank adventurers to be affected by it either. He didn't want to stand out during this escort mission if he could help it, but if he doesn't do anything here, they're all going to die. It can't be helped. Jury stands up, 
as though the gravity spell weren't affecting him. Kefs simply believes he neglected to cast the spell on him, so he casts it again. However, it doesn't work. Kefs accuses him of having an extremely specific magic tool that disables gravity spells, but Jure, in the most deadpan manner possible, says no. Kefs plan to turn them all into mindless undead, but he'll make an exception for Jure. He'll have him die a horrible, painful death. He unleashes an abyssal ball of black flame, and everyone warns Jure to avoid it. Jure does the complete opposite and he sticks out his hand. The flame sticks to him, seemingly burning him alive. But Jure is completely unharmed. He tells his friends to stop shouting. The noise is hurting him more than the fire is. Everyone is left speechless. Jure claims he's survived dragon fire before, so this isn't any different. What asks him how he's still alive, and Jure realizes that the fire is still on him. That's annoying. He picks the fire up with his hands and throws it on the ground. Kefs starts panicking. Such a thing shouldn't be possible, not from a heavenly king like him. He tries using a variety of different elemental spells to defeat Jure, but he deals with all of them like they were child's attacks. He slaps the water dragon, kicks the stone coffin, and blows away the storm of annihilation. Kefs just stands there like the person standing emoji. Jure leaves him with no choice. He didn't want to use this if possible since it would be embarrassing to resort to it, but he's at his wit's end. Kefs begins casting the most powerful magic spell at his disposal, one that will guarantee death to those it connects with. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. A gigantic orb of darkness floats over the city of Edel, but only Jure stands defiant. Wed thinks that it's all over. There's no way that they'll survive such a catastrophic attack. Jury looks at the giant fireball heading their way, stretches out his hand, and says that it'll probably be okay. Probably, he says. With a wave of his hand, the fireball disappears. Kefs is confused and calls Jury a hacker, and he threatens to report him to the mods. Something about him is just plain unfair. Jury doesn't know what Kefs is all worked up about. All he did was completely nullify his finishing move. Kefs asks if he's really human, and Jury replies that no matter how you look at him, he is. More importantly, however, he can tell that Kefs is all out of mana and all out of auctions. Only the Second Amendment can save him now. Kefs is in a state of disbelief. There's no way a heavenly king like him could possibly be beaten by a human. That's why he resorts to more villainous methods, such as taking Cain hostage. Cain's body suddenly moves on its own, presumably under the control of Kefs. Kefs cackles and explains that even with the little mana he has left, he can still cast some manipulation magic. Now that he has a hostage, Jure can't do anything. It's all over now. Kefs, one of the four great heavenly kings, has won. Jure scratches his head and tells Kefs that Cain isn't really his friend. Well, there goes that plan. Kefs, a skeleton, starts sweating. Was he really mistaken in thinking that Cain was one of Jure's friends? What yells at Jure that now isn't the time for jokes like this, but Jure isn't really joking. His relationship with Cain would only really last until the escort mission finishes, so at best, He's an acquaintance, the kind that you'd nod your head to when you pass him on the street but never talk to. That's such a bad thing to say. Kefs starts wondering if Jure is the real villain in all this. But if that's the case, then Kefs simply has to use more hostages. He reveals that the entirety of Edel and all its citizens are at his mercy. What is confused because, from the outside, it seems like everyone inside is already dead. Jure understands what Kefs is talking about immediately. There is a falsehood barrier cast over the city of Edel making it seem like everyone inside has been turned into ghouls. The spell itself can only work under certain conditions, which in this case, are a red sky, collapsed buildings, and blood-stained walls. Jury mutters that Kefs has some really twisted taste. He bets that he likes to drink orange juice after brushing his teeth, too. Upon hearing that there is a possibility of saving the people inside the city of Edel, Raphine begs for them to be rescued. Kefs is surprised that Raphine cares that deeply for the city, and he astutely recognizes that there must be a really important person inside. However, right now, everything depends on how Jure acts. Raphine is willing to do whatever it takes if it means she is able to save that person inside the city. Jure recognizes that she must be talking about the hero trapped inside the barrier. He asks Raphine if she's really willing to do whatever it takes, but even so, she won't need to do any of those things. Jury waves his arm over the city and dissipates the falsehood barrier over the city. The citizens begin waking up from what seemed to be a short nap. Several of them feel as though they were in some kind of nightmare. The hero, safe and sound, stretches his arms and yawns. Horrified, Kefs asks what Jury did to his barrier. Jury explains that it's all so simple. A falsehood barrier only works if the conditions are in place, 
so all he did was change the conditions by clearing the sky and fixing the damaged city. That's all he did. Kaafs, realizing that he has truly lost, hastily plans his escape with Cain as a hostage. However, Cain isn't the same Cain as he was before. He selflessly tells Jurig to kill him along with Kaafs. His whole life, he's never been needed by anyone. So if he can find meaning and purpose through death, then he doesn't mind being killed right here. Jury tells Cain that he doesn't plan to kill him. Even though he thinks that Cain is a selfish noble who only looks out for himself, he still has a need for him. That's why he won't let him die. Jury forms a finger gun with his hand and kills Kaafs with a seemingly invisible spell. The gravity force over the adventurers dissipates, and they can stand up again. What embraces Jury, asking how he can be this powerful despite being a B rank? He really thought he was going to die there, you know. Raphine is amazed by what Jure has accomplished. Not only did he dispel the barrier like it was nothing, he also took out one of the four heavenly kings with a single attack. The adventurers crowd Jure, which is precisely what he was trying to avoid. But even so, being praised like this every now and then isn't so bad. Suddenly, Jure is overcome by a sense of intense bloodlust. The target isn't him, but Raphine. Jure instinctively leaps and pushes Raphine to the ground, and the attack harmlessly hits him instead. The attack that he just witnessed was suspiciously similar to the kind used by Lena's family, but he sees no reason for Lena to try anything like that now. After Jury makes sure that Raphine is fine, Raphine asks him if he is okay. He's fine, save for the nasty burn on his now ruined shirt. He takes it off right in front of Raphine, inadvertently showing her a scar that seems all too familiar to her. She's seen it before. Is Jury the droid she's been searching for all this time? 